Oh, well, Mission Hills, it is so good to see you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Reza. Uh, you saw that on the screen, and uh, it's not a very common name. I know that. Um, I was born in Iran, and my family came to the United States uh, when I was really young. So I have a very common Iranian name, um, Reza Zadeh. But I'll be very honest, uh, Reza Zadeh is not the name my, my parents gave me. Uh, the name my parents gave me is Ali Reza Sarahiani Zadeh. And um, I hear your laughs. Uh, that's what TSA says when I try to fly. And um, so I can tell you all about being detained in airports. And so, but um, came to the United States when I was really young. Uh, my dad worked uh, for the Shah of Iran, which used to be the king of Iran. Worked in his oil industry, kind of oil company. And so he got sent to work in Houston for a year. And so my mom and I came with him. Um, and we didn't, my, my mom and I didn't speak any English at all. We're living in Houston. And then my, uh, my, my dad was working. And then a revolution happened in Iran where the Shah was overthrown and the Ayatollah came into power. And it's kind of the country that we now know. And my parents said, well, let's just stay in the United States until politically things die down. And then we'll move back. And uh, 38 years later, here we are. Uh, things do not die down politically, and it is not safe to go back. So this is home for us. Uh, grew up most of my life in Southern California. Had a little stop in Tonkawa, Oklahoma. Anyone know where Tonkawa, Oklahoma is? Got a couple people. There you go. So we moved there. My dad owned a truck stop, and so we were Middle Easterners, you know, running a convenience store, living out the stereotype, um, running a gas station, truck stop, all that stuff. But we were in Tonku, Oklahoma, running this, this, gap, this uh, truck stop um, in the early 80s. And um, if you remember, those of you that are around, you know that Iran took some American hostages. And so we were not the most popular individuals in Tonku, Oklahoma, um, living in the early 80s. And so we ended up living in Southern California, and I was raised in Southern California. And so when people ask me where you're from, I say I was born in Iran, um, but I grew up in Southern California. And I'll share a little bit more of my story, but if we're going to spend the morning together, I might as well introduce my family to you as well. So I have a picture of, you, of my family I want to show you here. And so this is me. I promise I have more shirts than just white shirts. Um, I think I'm wearing the exact same shirt in that picture. My wife, Allison, and I are right there in the middle. The girl on the left there, that is our 10-year-old daughter, Olivia. She is 10 going on 19. And uh, she is responsible. We have about 13 animals around our house. And she is an animal lover. And a few months ago, she really wanted a cat. And I'm like putting my foot down. I was like, we're not getting a cat. No way we can have a cat. We have too many animals. And she goes, but I really want a cat. And so there was a uh, assignment at school. She had to write a persuasion like paragraph. And she wrote a persuasion paragraph on why we should get a cat. And she mailed it to us. She like put it in the mail, put a stamp on it. We received it. And I'm still like, we're not getting a cat. And I kid you not, like a few weeks later, this little kitten started showing up in a bush next to our house. And uh, Moses saw a burning bush. I got a cat in a bush. And, uh, and literally, now we have a cat who lives in our garage because God sent my daughter a cat. And so that's our 13th animal. And then my son was on the right there. That's Owen. That's my buddy there. Um, Owen is now nine years old. And Owen loves Jesus. He's amazing. Um, he's got a heart for people. We transitioned. We used to homeschool for a while. Then we moved. And now we go to the public school, you know, the neighborhood school down the road. And he came home one day. And we're sitting around the table. And some of you might do this with your kids, like high lows. What were the highs for the day? What were the lows for the day? And I said, oh, and what's your low? And he puts his head down, lip comes out. And I was like, what's up? He's like, I just found out my best friend at school is not a Christian. And I'm like, well, that's all right, buddy. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, how do you know he's not a Christian? And he's like, I walked up to him one day. He was sitting down and I said, are you Christian? And the kid said, no, my name's Eli. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I kind of laughed and he kind of laughed too. I was like, no, but, but I was like, and I was like, well, how do you know? He's like, well, I asked him. I was like, do you follow Jesus? Do you read the Bible? Do you go to church? And he said, no. And I said, well, Owen, what'd you do? And he's like, I just got up and walked away. And so um, he's great, loves kids. He's amazing. And then that little girl that was sitting on my lap there, that's Macy. Um, she is now six years old. And a couple of years ago, she was our family vegetarian. And it, it happened like this. Her and my wife were driving along. We live in Fort Collins, and they were driving along a road. And there's this restaurant there called Famous Dave's Barbecue. Some of you are familiar with it. Have you ever looked at the logo of Famous Dave's? It's a pig in fire. And for a five-year-old girl, that's traumatic. And so she looked at my wife and said, why is there a pig in fire? And she, my wife said, well, that's what you do. You cook animals and you eat them, and that's what happens. She's like, I'm not eating animals anymore. 
And so I'm, we're talking around the dinner table that night, and I'm like, Macy, you're not going to eat animals? She said, nope, not going to eat any more animals. I was like, what about hamburgers? You like, at the time, she liked hamburgers. She goes, is there animal in hamburger? I said, yeah, there's cows. And she's like, nope, not going to eat them. I was like, well, what about hot dogs? And she goes, is there animals in hot dogs? And I said, there's some pig, you know, in hot dogs. She goes, nope, nope, not going to eat hot dogs. And then I thought I got her, and please don't judge us here, because I know, like, oh, so our first two kids, it was like organic everything, fresh food. We chopped every, like, we made their meals. Third child, chicken nuggets, breakfast, lunch, dinner. That's all she eats is chicken. I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating. And so I go, well, Macy, what about like chicken nuggets? And she goes, wait a minute. Is there chicken in chicken nuggets? And I said, sometimes there is, there is. And then one day we're out at breakfast together and she starts crying and she says, I miss bacon. And I said, there's nothing holding you back. So that was the end of her vegetarian phase. So that's her. So that's our staged family picture. We're missionaries. And so we send that out to our prayer letters and people to support us. But this is the reality picture of our family right here. Like that's reality for us. Um, and there's some context here. You'll notice I'm the only one wearing shoes and there's a reason for that. This was, this was Easter a couple of years ago. Um, we work with uh, athletes and I'll share that here in a little bit. We're missionaries with athletes. And uh, we had a whole bunch of college athletes at our house for Easter brunch. And so we opened up our backyard and we had a bunch of gangs. We had about 50, 55 athletes there. And so we're having a blast and then we're putting our kids to bed at the end of the night. And then my wife and I look at each other and we're like, we haven't taken an Easter picture. So we got the kids out of bed, got them to change back into their clothes. And I was the only one that put my shoes on in that picture. And that picture was the result of that genius, genius thought there. So that's my family. But, I, but my story is I grew up in Southern California, like I said, got involved playing football in high school and, and did pretty well with it. But I had no idea what American culture was about. We were an Iranian family. I grew up Muslim, did not know the Lord really at all. I knew some things about Jesus, but didn't know him. But I'm an Iranian family living in Southern California, trying to figure out American culture. And so going into high school, like having to learn about prom, I had no idea what prom was. I watched Beverly Hills 90210 and I'm like, okay, well, that's what American culture is all about. How scary, how scary is that? That's how I learned about everything is by watching TV. And so I went through my high school years, found myself in Fort Collins playing football at Colorado State University. And so I was a Ram, moved into the dorms there. And so I thought, well, if high school is what I saw on TV, then college is what I see on TV too. So my first year in the dorms was filled with what typically you would think of as a first year person in the dorms, you know, partying, drinking, drugs, I mean, just all the stuff that you would do in college. And I was involved in all of that. And then after my first year, some roommates and I decided, hey, let's move into this apartment complex. That's where we're going to live next year. It was a fairly new apartment complex, and it was where all the parties were at. This little apartment complex called Rams Village, right west of campus. So we move into Rams Village apartment complex, and we're thinking to ourselves, this is going to be the greatest summer of our life, because we had to stay there. We had summer school and workouts, and so we're, we're just going to move in there for the summer. So we moved in, and in Fort Collins, everyone was gone at the time. And so we had literally this apartment complex to ourselves. We're like one apartment filled with, you know, some athletes and we're hanging out in there. And we had a swimming pool to ourselves. Like it was dangerous. Like we had the entire place to ourselves for the summer. And then something horrific happened. We're looking out the window of the apartment complex and these minivans start coming into the apartment complex. And we're like thinking to ourselves, like we see some minivans around campus, but if you know minivan culture, these were Toyota Siennas and Honda Odysseys. Like these are like the elite minivans like that were coming in. You don't see them around college campuses. And so we're kind of looking out there and then even worse, kids started getting out of the minivans. And we're like, what are these kids doing here? Like the things that we're going to be doing, like kids shouldn't be around. Like this should not be, what are they doing here? And then it got even worse. The parents got out and had the audacity to start unpacking their bags. And this was the first week of June. And we're like, what are these people doing? Like families, this is not for, this is like our apartment. Don't these people know? This is gonna be the best party of our, the best summer of our life. Like they shouldn't be here. Well, it turns out we sent one of my roommates down. We kind of picked him. We're like, hey, you go down there and find out who these people are and when are they leaving? And so he goes down, we saw him talking and we're like staring outside the window. And he comes up and he slams the door and he's like, well, the Christians are in town. <laughs> and we're like, what do you mean the Christians are in town? He goes, I don't know. These people are Christians. And then they said this place is going to be filled with Christians all summer long. 
And we're like, great, this is gonna be the worst summer of our life. Like, we're gonna sit in the dark, sing Kumbaya, light candles, and all that stuff. Well, here's what happened. There was a missions organization, a worldwide missions organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. They do their national staff conference or U.S. staff conference, just happens to be in Fort Collins every other year. And so this group of people that were moving in, they were there to run a camp for athletes. They were part of this missions organization. There's a little part of, of Campus Crusade, of crew, called Athletes in Action that specifically works with college, Olympic, and professional athletes. And they happen to be living in this apartment complex with us. And so we were stuck with the Christians. And we were like, man, and then we find out they're going to be there all summer long. Like, they're going to go do their Christian things, and we're going to do our non-Christian you know, things, and we're, we're going to have to live together in this apartment complex. And we're thinking, this is going to be horrific. But I tell you what, over the weeks as we got to know them, this, these particular families ended up being there, moved in first week of June. They didn't leave till the end of July. And the rest of the staff joined them in July. But so for eight weeks, there was a group of families that we hung out with almost every single day. Like we would barbecue together. We would hang out. We would talk. We played games. Like they let us take their kids to the swimming pool. And I'm like, I wouldn't take a college freshman to a swimming pool. I wouldn't trust me with that. And you're giving me your kids to go play with. Like we had a lot of fun. And here's what we found. They weren't perfect people. Like, they, we, we heard some of the husbands and wives arguing and bickering. And I don't know if you know this, but even Christian husbands and wives argue and bicker, you know, sometimes. We caught some of their older kids smoking. But there was something about them, and we were like, man, these people are pretty great. And then the apartment complex got filled with a whole bunch of other Christians. And they just started living out their life. And after eight weeks, we were like, man, these people are different. There's this piece about, I got to figure out what that is, because I really like them. And so the night before the conference ended, the couple we got closest with, they were living next door to us, they invited us over for dinner. And they invited us over for dinner and they sat us down, I'll never forget, they cooked spaghetti and meatballs, which that's how you reach college students as you feed them. And they sit us down and we're sitting on the couch, and I'll never forget, the little nine-year-old daughter at the time gave us these little yellow books called The Four Spiritual Laws, passed it out to every single one of us, and they simply walked through this little booklet with us. First First one, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Second, man is sinful and separated from God. Third, Jesus is God's only provision for man's sin. And fourthly, you can be in relationship with God for eternity through putting your full faith, trust, and belief in the name of Jesus. Friends, no one had ever told me any of those things about Jesus. Growing up Muslim, there's some things I knew about Jesus. I, I trusted Jesus. Muslims adhere to the teachings of Jesus the virgin birth, the miracles, all of those. But it was, you know, being the son of God and dying for our sins and being resurrected that Muslims can't get over, which those are obviously pretty big deals, um, you know, that you need to come to terms with. And so no one had ever told me these things. And I remember we said goodbye and kind of, you know, we said our goodbyes. And at that point, I was almost tearing up because eight weeks of friendship and they're about to leave. And so I went back to my apartment and I sat on my bed and I said, God, if what they said is true about Jesus, I want Jesus in my life. And so it was through an eight-week relationship with this couple. And then we woke up the next morning and all the families were packing up everything. And here's where I realized I didn't stand a chance. Because we opened up our front door and everyone had left their extra groceries on our front doorstep. And so I realized everybody had been praying for us. Now here's what you need to know about this couple. This couple we live next door to, their names are Steve and Debbie Temer. Steve grew up in Littleton. Steve grew up here at Mission Hills Church. Steve and Debbie were missionaries that were supported by Mission Hills Church in the late 90s. In the late 90s, Mission Hills Church was supporting them as missionaries as they were serving athletes and sharing the gospel with me. And so friends, I'm standing here today as a spiritual legacy and as fruit of the, of the ministry of Mission Hills Church and all the people that have given throughout the years. And so you didn't even know this, but you've got, you didn't even realize you have an Iranian in your family. And so welcome. I'm glad to be, I'm like a spiritual, like grand, great grandson, whatever it is, but we're together. And so Mission Hills, thank you for your investment in missions and the way that you give to missions. It's because of that then that I get to stand here now and proclaim the word of God in front of you. And so that's thrilling for me and my family. 
But one of the questions I oftentimes get when I share my story of where I've come from and growing up Muslim is, well, what about your family? Like, what about your mom, dad? I have a little sister. Um, my little sister has come to know the Lord. She came to know the Lord, so she's walking with the Lord, married in Southern California. But my mom and dad, people often ask, well, what happened with them? How, how, how did that ever turn out? And I remember for years I'd been praying that God would open a door for me to talk to my parents about my faith. And, and after I'd, be, I'd come to know the Lord in college, I was discipled, went to Bible studies, grew in my faith. Um, I was a coach for two seasons on the college level at Colorado State, and uh, so coached as a graduate assistant. And then after that, realized I liked people much more than I liked football, and so I decided to go into ministry. And so I became a pastor, was a local church pastor for 12 years. Eight and a half of those years focused on college students up in Fort Collins, and then my wife and I, we planted, we planted a church community in, in Windsor, Colorado. About five years ago, we resigned from that because we sensed God was calling us to join this organization, Athletes in Action. So we resigned from the church, and we stepped into this ministry, raising our support. Now we get to serve athletes along the front range of Colorado. I oversee six athletic departments uh, that we have here along the front range. We have a team that serves the different athletic departments. And at the same time, my wife and I get to serve as chaplains for the Denver Broncos. And so this will be our third season serving the men and women um, that play and that represent that organization. And so throughout the years, my father has heard about my ministry and he's listened to some of my sermons and this and that, but, but I've never had an opportunity to kind of share exactly what my faith is. And one day I was visiting my family. It was about seven years ago. And I can't remember, we were like driving to Home Depot or something. I remember where we were going. And my dad asked me this question. And he says, what's the difference? I know, I know you're, you're a Christian. What's the difference between Islam and, and Christianity? And I'm thinking to myself, um, you might need to drive to the Home Depot like three towns away, you know, for us to finish this conversation. And I was trying to think about how, how can I share this in a way that he would understand? And I remember it came to me, there's this parable, this story that Jesus told, and I thought, I'm going to just share this story with my dad and just kind of expose a little bit about what the gospel is and who Jesus is and what this major difference between Islam and Christianity is all about. If you grew up in church, you know this story. If you knew someone who grew up in church, you probably heard of this story. If you've ever driven by a church, you know the story of the prodigal son. And so if you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Luke chapter 15. If you got a device you want to go through or just look up on the screen, totally fine. But as we're driving along, I'm thinking, I'm going to tell my dad the story of a father and two sons. Because here's why I want to share the story. Because in the story, in the scripture, in the story that Jesus tells, this fabricated story that Jesus tells is he uses to make an illustration point. My dad would understand the cultural ramifications of what Jesus was talking about in the story. And so I'm saying, Dad, here's, I, I, I can go into all the different differences and theological here and there, but let me just tell you the story that Jesus told. Jesus tells a story. It's in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. You can follow along. And I said, Dad, Jesus tells a story. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so my dad looks at me, and already my dad's like, what? Because I understand, when does somebody get their share of the estate or when does someone get an inheritance? When they die. And so this son was literally saying to his dad, hey, I wish you were dead. I don't want to be in a relationship with you. I don't want to know you. I don't want anything to do with you, but I want your stuff. Can you please give me what's mine? I want my things. Just give me what I have and I want to be done with you. Now, do you know, not just to any man, but to a Middle Eastern man, that was incredibly disgraceful because of all the things that are represented in this place. He had two sons, a younger one said, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And my dad's like, he did what? Like he actually gave him that? I'm like, you know, that's the story that Jesus had told. And then it goes on, verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now think to yourself, why did this guy, why did he go to a distant country? Because he knew what he was about to get himself involved with. I mean, he knew the type of party. I mean, he was going to throw down. It was going to be on. He didn't want anybody around to know who he was because he was going to get away from home and do anything that he wanted to do. But then we find that he squandered his wealth in wild living. And my dad's absolutely appalled at this point saying, this is this, there's no way Jesus would have told a story like this to a Middle Eastern 
culture. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. And this is where my dad says, well, that serves him right. Because you got to understand, in the Middle Eastern culture, especially in Muslim culture, you absolutely get what you deserve. That there's no room for grace. That what you do, you're going you're gonna to reap the benefits of it. And so this was a picture, in my dad's eyes, of he disobeyed his dad, God was punishing him. That's the picture that my dad got. And so he's understanding there was a severe famine in that land. And he began to be in need. So he went out and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. You see, here's, here's a picture here that I don't want us to miss. That this son, this younger son who went out, he was motivated by something. You and I were all motivated by something. He was motivated by worldly pleasures. He was motivated looking for life independent of his father. That everything that he was, that he was going after the emotional high. How can I find pleasure? And that's what motivates me. And he got himself involved in a lot of these things. That his entire worth and everything that he was was dependent upon things that this world offers. I'll never forget, it was a couple of years ago, it was my first season as chaplain um, with the team. And we start off the season, and uh, we had a new coaching staff. A lot of new things were happening, a lot of new players. And we start off the season pretty well. We're 3-0. and We ended up going to Buffalo, and there were some things that were happening around the NFL and social media and all these things. It was kind of a chaotic week. We end up losing in Buffalo. We're 3-1, and and we come back. We're playing in Denver on Sunday night football against the 0-4 Giants. And so we're thinking 3-1, and one, doing pretty well, had a little bump on the road in Buffalo. We're playing the 0-4 Giants, Sunday night football, tens of millions of people all around the country are going to be watching. We're going to get this thing back on track. The game starts. Many of you have been there. Many of you have seen it on TV. Broncos run out on the field for pregame. I mean, people go crazy. There's fire. I mean, it's fire. It's amazing. People are cheering like crazy. However, the first half did not go so well for us. We quickly find ourselves down 24 to nothing at the end of the second quarter, running into the tunnel. Running into the tunnel, the same people that were cheering when that game started, guess what they were doing? They were booing. I'm not, I'm not, not just booing, like booing, like really booing. And there's just this picture that I just remember sitting there. I was at the game with my son and we're watching this and we had Bible study the next day. And I remember bringing up some of the guys, hey, did you guys catch what happened last night? And they're like, actually, we want to forget it. But I said, no, no, did you guys picture this? You run onto the field, people are cheering you. And 90 minutes later, because you didn't meet their expectations, what happened? They start booing you. You see, friends, if we try to find our life and our worth in the hands of other people or in things in this world, we're going to find ourselves severely disappointed. And in verse 17, the story goes on and, and he says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I'm going to set out and I'm going to go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. And my dad, as we're talking about this, he said, this could never happen. Because if he disgraced his father the way that he did, and did you catch in the be in previously when I read that there was a guy who sent him into the fields to go feed the pigs? Do you know pigs are pretty filthy animals in that culture? That pigs would actually dishonor you, that you couldn't live holy in the presence of God if you'd even touched a pig? And this is another picture of this story that the son went out to a distant country to try to live out his wild desires and do everything he wanted. The people in the distant countries knew about the Jewish traditions. If they wanted to shame somebody, especially a Jew, you know what they would do? Send him out to the pigs. And so not only did he dishonor his family, he dishonored God because he was hanging out with swine. And so he gets up and he goes back to his father. And my dad's thinking, there's no way this would happen because the father actually has a right to stone him to death. Not only disown him, not only shame him, but stone him to death because that's the penalty for bringing shame to a family name. But in verse 20, 
It says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. There's some things in here that we've got to understand. And my dad caught it when I said it to him. You know, there's not a whole lot of people going out for jogs in the Middle East. Okay, just very plain. There's not a lot of, you know, Under Armour. There's not, you know, dry fit. There's not a lot of those things. And especially old men. And we're going to presume this, uh, this gentleman was older. We, we read in a little bit, he's got servants, he's got property, he's got sons, he's dividing it. So he's probably pretty well off in age, kind of a, kind of a prestigious guy, probably a dignitary of some, of some sort. And the scripture says, as Jesus was telling the story, he's sitting on his, I just imagine him sitting on his porch just waiting for his son to come home. And he sees the shadow come over the, the horizon and there's just really scrawny, he's like, that can't be my son kind of walks like, kind of looks like him. And he's like, that's my son. And it says that he got up and he ran towards him. Now, do you know, they didn't wear like shorts back then. In the middle, especially these kind of, they would wear robes. Do you know what you have to do to run in a robe? Like you got to pull your robe up and we're in church. That's all I'm going to say. You can use your imagination. He had to pull his robe up and he had to start running. And he runs to his son and he embraces him. And he kisses him. And in verse 22, and the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Do you know why this made no sense to my father? Because in Islam, there is no room for grace or mercy. There's five pillars that you adhere to. At the end of your life, there's this weighted scale of good and bad, and does the good outweigh the bad? And in in a very simplistic form, even saying, even if Allah wills it, then you're able to enter into a paradise. So you could adhere to all the five pillars, your good could outweigh the bad, but if Allah doesn't will it, you're not going to enter into a paradise. See, there's no room for grace and mercy. So my dad is thinking, saying, this doesn't make sense. You see, grace is something that's hard to understand, especially from Middle Eastern culture, because grace is getting something you don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what you do deserve. You see, the son deserved to be shut out from his family when he came home. But the father showed grace by putting his arms around him and embracing him back in the family. And he shows him mercy, not giving him what he did deserve. You know what's cool about God's mercy? that God's standard for who deserves mercy is really low. God does not have a high standard for who deserves, God's standard is really low for who deserves mercy. Listen, the Apostle Paul says it like this in Colossians chapter, chapter two. He's a paraphrase. When you were stuck in your old dead sin life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. And here's the thing, a lot of us think I've messed up too much. There's no way like I can just, I can get this mercy. And there's a lot of times I'm talking to a lot of athletes, I talk to a lot of people, I say, how many of you fix your own ACLs before you go see the doctor? You don't. You go to the doctor because there's something that needs to be healing and the doctor works on you. The same goes for God. We don't need to clean ourselves up before we come to him. But he gives us grace and mercy. And my dad's thinking to himself, well, he said there was two sons. Did Jesus mention the other son? Like, what did he have to say? And actually, my dad says, wait, this is the younger son? I said, yeah. He said, there's an older son? I said, yeah. So not only did this younger son disgrace his dad by saying, you're dead to me, just give me my stuff. He jumped his older brother in in the order of who gets the inheritance. Here's how the older son responds, verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Presumably he was working in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother rejoiced and celebrated. Just kidding. The older brother, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and you never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, 
not even my brother, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with wild living comes home, you kill the fattened calf? Like, dad, we were saving that fattened calf for a good celebration, not wasting this on this guy. You see, the older brother was motivated by some things as well. If the younger brother was motivated by worldly pleasures, the older brother was motivated by a life of performance. He was motivated by self-righteousness. You see, he thought that he would have life, he'd have relationship, he found his worth and his affirmation and how hard he worked. You see, he was the kid, he went to Awanas, he got the patches, he's in Bible study, he goes to church, he gives money to the missions, he listens to Caleb, he does all the things right. And he thinks that life and relationship with his father is going to be found in how hard he works. And they think he misses it as well. You see, a lot of us, we have, our perform- we, we have the things that we achieve. And we try to take the things that we achieve and we put them before God and say, God, look how great I've done. You know, I'm sure there's some people in here who have earned PhDs and there's a whole lot of study and tests and papers and research that goes into that. But no one takes their PhD and stand in front of the Grand Canyon and try to compare that to what God has done. You don't take your financial portfolio and look at your financial portfolio and think that it compares to the glory and wonder of a Rocky Mountain sunset in July. Our performance does not gain us life. And this, old, this older son missed it because the response to a life like this is anger, bitterness, stubbornness, and pride. And I think some of us might be sitting here I know traditionally this story is called the prodigal son, but I wonder which son is the prodigal. They're both lost. They've both missed the father. One missed the father because he looked for life and he, gained, he looked for life and worth through worldly pleasures. One looked for life and worth through performing and the father himself was motivated by something as well. The father was motivated by his relationship with his sons. He wanted fellowship with them. You see, in Luke 15, verse 20, the father looks up and he sees and he has compassion as he runs to his son. And in verse 22, we see that he put a robe around his, he put a robe around him. And I just have this picture in my mind of this robe representing that the father is covering the shame of this young man who's gone away. And he wants that shame to be covered so he doesn't have to live shameful anymore. And he puts a ring on his finger. And the ring, it's not like this, you know, silicone ring that represents this covenant that my wife and I are in. This ring would, would presumably have the family seal on it. And when those rings, you know what you use that ring for was to sign contracts, was to make agreement, was to enter into agreements with other people. Essentially, the father was saying, you are a part of us just like you've never left. That you sign for us, you speak for us, you are us and we are you. And lastly, he put sandals on his feet. And again, I just imagine the bottom of his feet were cut up and blistered from the long journeys and the living that he did. And Jesus was illustrating that the father wanted to cover that with sandals and comfort him. And then he reminds the performance-driven son in, in in Luke 15, 28, that he pleads him to come in and celebrate. Verse 31 and 32, my son, the father said, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. You already have my inheritance, my earthly possessions. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is now found. Amen. You see, he was reminding his son that everything I have is already yours. But you've got to remember, son, our inheritance and the things that we get, it's not limited to this world. That we can't look to this world for the entirety of what we look for in worth. We have to look for the next life and the life that is to come. See, as I'm telling my dad the story, we arrived at Home Depot and, and it was a good conversation. My dad is not a believer yet. Um, he, he's not a Muslim anymore, neither is my mother, but they're not believers yet. But I know that was one step in the conversation in their story. But here's the truth. John, the apostle, as he introduces us to Jesus in the New Testament, in John chapter one, verse 12, very poignantly states, that all who did receive him, Jesus, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to be called children of God. 
And I believe with my heart that today there's some people here that maybe like me in that apartment years ago, your spiritual eyes are opening because you're hearing these words of the Father, that your worth and your affirmation and, your, and who you are is not dependent upon things of this world or your performance, but your worth comes from another place. I want you to watch this quick video of a comedian who's talking about his infant baby being born and something amazing that happened in that room. Watch this video. Yo, comedian Michael Jr. here. As you know, I just flat out enjoy doing comedy. But one of the things I love way more than that is being a dad. Not too long ago, I'm going through some video footage and I run into this video of my youngest daughter being born. Now, of course, I was there, I actually took the video, but I had never really experienced it from this perspective before. Now look, we're in the hospital room, she's uh, sticky, and she's baby and all that stuff, and she's in the middle of crying. And then I speak up, I start talking to her, and watch how she responds when she hears my voice. Okay, Portland, look, I'm right here. It's okay, it's okay. I'm right here, I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay, it's okay, I'm right here. Right here, yeah, it's okay. It's okay, baby, it's okay. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. <laughs> so check it. A few minutes later, uh, the nurse starts working on her, puts her pamper on her, and uh, I'm not saying anything, and she actually starts to cry again. Then I speak up, she hears my voice, and stops crying, like again. But I want you to notice what else happens after I tell her that I love her. Portland, it's okay. It's okay, it's good, it's good, it's good. I'm right here, I'm right here. I am right here. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah. You know, friends, I don't want us to miss the picture of that delivery room. But I just imagine that this gentleman, Michael Jr., was speaking to his little daughter when she was in the womb for months and months and months. And then when this baby comes in the world, which has got to be traumatic, I mean, it's cold, people are touching you, and there's all these things happening. She starts crying, and she hears this voice that sounds familiar. And it calms her, and it gives her peace that surpasses understanding. Friends, I wonder, I just wonder, if throughout the course of your life, if God's been knocking and speaking, and when you hear his voice, there's something in you that calms you. You just can't picture what that voice is. But you know it brings you peace and it calms you. It's just the story of the gospel. And then he says, I love you. You see what happened to her eyes? Her eyes opened for the very first time. For the first time her eyes opened was in response to this voice that she had thought she had heard. And this voice says, I love you. And then her eyes were opened. You see, to me, that's the core difference between Islam and Christianity. Islam is do everything you can to earn God's love. The gospel of Jesus is the work's already been done because the Father loves you Amen. and pulls you into relationship. So my prayer is that we would understand the depths of this love for us. And you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know if I deserve this. The grace and mercy, that all sounds great, but I've messed up too much. I'm totally far away from God. I've, I've separated myself. Not only am I squandering and wild living, I'm also performing like I'm double messed up. But you know, Jesus is a much better forgiver than you are sinner. I just want you to know that. You can't out -sin his grace. You can't out -sin his mercy because he is much better at forgiving than you are sinning. Here's again how the Apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. 
I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing, living or dead, angelic, demonic, today, tomorrow, high, low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Like, do you get it? Like, God's love is eternal. It goes on forever. His mercy goes on forever and ever. His grace goes on forever and ever and ever. It's like a Taylor Swift song. Forever and ever and ever. It continues to go on. He pours his grace out upon us. You know, like I said, I get to work with athletes, college, Olympic, pro athletes for a living. And here's the hard part. Because for athletes, everything they do on the field or in the pool or on the track or wherever they compete, everything they do is scrutinized and it determines their worth to a team or an organization or a school. And that's exhausting. And one of the things my wife and I and our team get to do is just share with athletes, this is who you are. Beyond what you do, this is who you are and this is whose you are. But you know that message doesn't just, it's not just limited to athletes. That's for Everybody. That what this world promises you will never fill you. There's not enough Instagram likes that are going to give you the affirmation that your soul craves. I don't care how many Pinterest parties you, throw, you, you put on. If you look for your worth in things of this world, you're going to be severely disappointed. Your worth is not determined on what you do or what other people say about you. Your worth is determined. A worth of something is determined on how much someone is willing to pay for that item. And you know what your worth is? Jesus gave his life for you. That's how much you are worth. No matter if you feel it or understand it or know it or believe it, it's true. That's the great thing about the gospel. You cannot believe it. It's still true. I want you to watch one more video. And I promise I'll be done. But I want you to watch this relationship between this father who's also a coach and a son who is a pitcher. I want to make one more point and then I'll pray and then we'll be gone. Finally tonight, the young pitcher and the pep talk from his coach heard by millions. It's the biggest game of their young lives. Game from South Williamsport, Pennsylvania, the, first the Little League team from Bend, Oregon, in a battle with a team from Italy. Isaiah Bugsy Jensen on the mound. Hi, my name is Bugsy Jensen. I'm my favorite baseball player at Clayton Kershaw. 12-year-old Isaiah pitching a great game until he gets a little tired in the top of the fifth. Now he can take his base. Out comes his coach for a pep talk. But that coach comes just happens to be Bugsy's dad. I just came out to tell you how much I love you as a dad and a player, okay? You're doing awesome out here. One more hitter and then I'm going to Juge. This is your last hitter, okay? You understand? Come right after Hey, cheer up. Have some fun. Come right after okay? Let's go. One more batter before Bugsy's replaced. That pep talk from dad worked. Another strikeout, and the team goes on to win. Victory from nine players from Bend, Oregon, and one very proud dad. See, that kid was struggling, and dad knew it. You see, dads, if I could just say this, just because I'm a dad, and I, I understand this, the youth sports, everything. A dad walks out on the mound. First thing he didn't say is, hey, you got to pitch better. Hey, you got to get your act together. We're going to lose this game if you don't start pitching. He didn't say that. The first thing he said, I just want you to know I love you. I love you. I accept you. You're already accepted. Now, strike this guy out. We got a job to do. But I need you to know that I love you. There is a job to do. And here's what's cool about that. I love that last pitch that kid threw. When he struck that guy out and then he was replaced, they go on to win. I love it because I just, I just have this picture in my mind in the spiritual sense that the chains were off of his shoulders. It didn't matter if he struck the guy out or didn't strike the guy out. I mean, ultimately they could have won or lost the game. I get that. But his ultimate worth was already determined. That his dad's opinion of him wouldn't change. Imagine what life would be like, friends, if we entered into the things that we enter into knowing we're already accepted. You're already, you're already worthy. Your worth has already been determined. The affirmation is there through the 66 words and the 66 books that make up this thing called the Bible. God loves you. He has a plan for you. We are separated from him. Unfortunately, there have been people that, and because of sin, people have been enslaved, people have been hurt. There's a lot of hurt, pain, racism. There's a lot of stuff happening in our culture because of this. But Jesus, but Jesus, 
redeems us and shows us who we are. Friends, would you stand with me as we pray? Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the words of scripture that literally remind us of the words you've been whispering to us throughout the course of our life. And I pray, God, that our spiritual eyes would continue to stay open. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.